are back on the Zero Hour. I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Escow. And once again, we are talking with our good friend, Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf, economist, economic historian, host of Economic Update on Free Speech TV, and the author of a number of books, including the latest, The Sickness is the System. I still really like that title. Uh, and we're going to catch up on things right now. So first of all, Richard Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you, RJ. As usual, very glad to be here. Well, let's start with this. Uh, very interesting press release uh, created quite a bit of a stir, I would say, from Fitch, a so-called ratings agency. We can talk more about that later. It had their own headline, Fitch downgrades the United States long-term ratings to AA+. Plus from AAA, which for those who don't know, is a downgrade for sure, outlook stable, meaning it's not headed for the toilet quite yet, but not. And here's what they say, Richard Wolf, they say this reflects expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years, a high and growing government debt burden, and the erosion of governance. Very interesting. What do they mean by erosion of governments? A in Fitch's view, there has been a steady deterioration in standards of governance over the last 20 years. Uh, so we can get to all of that. Um, but let's start with this. Uh, what's your reaction to this uh, rather impactful uh, um, decision by Fitch? Well, I think <clears throat> the way I would get into it is to say the uh, Democrats, because they are the party in the White House, have done what parties in the White House always do, which is to cherry pick the economic data that they publicize. And these days it's a decline in our inflation rate it is a low historical unemployment rate and a few other items. They leave out the many, many other indices that don't look so good or look downright awful. And again, they're just doing what the party in power does, which we as Americans tolerate, although we shouldn't. You know, what our government tells us ought to be grounded in an honest, confrontation with the good news and the bad news and then an attempt to understand what it all adds up to but we don't have that we have politicians who are advertisers for whatever it is they sell democrats like biden and his folks therefore pick economic data that make it sound make it look like the economy is doing great it isn't but they keep saying it. The Republicans disparage it, but because they're not, how shall I say this politely? Well, let's dispense with it. Not being the sharpest knives in the drawer, not that the Democrats are all that much better, but the Republicans do their dutiful bit to say, well, there are problems. Well, things could get worse. But it's kind of lame. So the Democrats have gotten away with the notion that the economy is in good shape. So that's the background. In comes Fitch Ratings Corporation. Let me just a, a, brief, a brief background so everyone's on the same page. There are three companies in the whole world that dominate in defining how creditworthy borrowers are, whether the borrower is a corporation or the borrower is a national government, any borrower that issues public debt of one kind or another is evaluated. The three companies, in case you've heard of them, Standard & Poor is one, Moody's is the second, and Fitch is the third. There are other companies that provide ratings, but they are small in comparison to these three giants. When they say something about the credit worthiness of a borrower, the whole world pays attention. The minute they downgraded the United States government, which they did on August 2nd, in the first thing in the morning, it cost the United States government, get ready 
hundreds of millions, probably billions of dollars in higher interest payment because they are no longer respected the way they were before that announcement in terms of their credit worthiness. In other words, what Fitch told us is if you're a lender to the United States government, the risk of your doing that just went up. The United States is in, here we go now, economic trouble. Now they say this in their polite lingo of these companies, but it's unmistakable. There's instability in your economy. You are borrowing more money than we could ever have imagined. And you're promising with your new budget to borrow even more this year and the next two or three. And it's so bad that it's shaking up your whole society. It's making the level of political struggle between the Democrats and Republicans get shakier and uglier and more extreme with each passing year. And we're noticing it. And we're not going to tell people it's safe to lend the way it once was to the United States. So it turns out that the public opinion polls in America, which show that the majority of Americans are very nervous about their economic situation, very unclear that the direction of the economy is where they want it to be, very, very dark when asked, how do you think the economy will be 5, 10, 15 years from now? It turns out the mass of people are in agreement with Fitch. Neither of them is in agreement with the Biden Democrats and the pundits in economics who keep looking at those numbers that they enjoy and that are good for them and good for the economy, like low income, uh, low inflation and low unemployment. But they don't look at the rising debt, out of control debt, this is a very serious decision of the Fitch Corporation. They know, for example, that it will make them very unpopular with the United States government, which is not a good idea for them. And you can imagine how strong they must feel the evidence is to take all the associated chances of being honest enough to say, that the United States is a borrower about whom creditors should be nervous. Last point, the two major creditors of the United States are Japan and the People's Republic of China. Those two countries are the largest creditors in the world for the United States. The United States is already the largest debtor country in the world. That's not a good sign, folks. And that's why Mr. Biden never refers to it. That's why the pundits and sadly the journalists don't ask about it. It's like that problem with the U.S. dollar that fewer and fewer businesses and countries are holding on to are looking to acquire. That's another measure of the downward slide of the American economic system, of the American empire built on that system. No, I think the Fitch decision yesterday will be remembered for a long time as a very powerful signal. The Republicans haven't made as much of it as they could have and should have. That's a comment on them. And the Democrats have do done everything they can to get all of their supporters either to pretend that nothing happened or else to dismiss it as if it were odd or strange. It's neither of those things. Fitch has been around, I believe it started as a firm in 1913. In other words, we're talking about a successful business that's over a 100 years old of experiencing assessing risk. And that firm, 
born and developed here in the United States, looks at the United States economy and says to potential lenders, watch out, you're not dealing with what you thought and what you used to be able to count on in the way of a reliable borrower borrower who will pay you interest and return your principal. The image that comes to mind, Richard Wolf, I, I, I can't it was one of those uh, detective movies either by Quentin Tarantino or or Abel Ferrara, somebody like Bad Lieutenant or something like that. But at the end of the movie, you have everybody standing in a circle pointing a gun at somebody else in the circle it's somehow because to me first of all just to like put this in context the rating so-called agencies that annoys the hell out of me i wrote a piece about them 14 13 14 years ago called the rating game because you know they were rigging their own ratings they don't work for the government but they do work for the banks right so right. senator levin did a and his subcommittee after the 2008 crisis did a pretty good job of uncovering uh what they would do to please those banks and make more money such as rate things triple a they didn't deserve to be triple a and we saw we know what happened there on the other hand the, since they do work for the banks their incentive is to get it right right they're not gonna they're not gonna downgrade something and then uh their customers find out oh that was actually trustworthy all along because they will have lost money so that's not in their financial interest but uh then you have the Chinese holding U.S debt you have the banks in there meanwhile the government another story that didn't get a lot of attention government says it needs cash so it's gonna issue more treasury bonds so the banks will buy them so that they'll have more cash uh which raises all sorts of questions to me but it's just this network of people threatening you know at uh, endangering each other it's a wacky and troublesome system uh well first of all do you agree with my analysis yes I mean I think you know let me revert to to trying to 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 tell the story in the simplest way I can. The United States government has the authority to spend money on a whole host of things. We all know what they are, uh, whether it's social security, uh, highways, wars, uh, a whole host of things that we as a society entrust to the government to spend the money to accomplish. And, and the law of the country uh, from the Constitution on, give the government the authority to do that. At the same time, we give the government the authority to tax us as a people, to tax us as individuals, and to tax us as businesses. In other words, corporations pay a tax on their profits, just as you and I pay a tax on our income to the federal government. Okay, this is part is usually well understood. Here comes uh, the fancy footwork, or to be more honest, the flim flam. Here we go. Suppose the government discovers that when it goes to tax corporations and the rich, it hits a wall. Turns out the corporations and the rich don't want to pay taxes. They want to keep their income and their wealth for themselves to decide what to do with. And because they are rich and powerful, they are able to, I'll be kind, persuade the political leaders of our country not to tax them. Here comes the flim flam. So the federal government discovers it cannot raise the money from corporations and the rich that it needs to do what everyone in the society, rich and poor, have told the government, we want you to do our highways, our social security, our colleges and university, so forth. So what does the government do? Now, here comes the flam on the other side of the flim. The government then says, okay, in order to do the spending 
thing that the population of our society, business and individuals, want us to do when we can't raise the necessary funds from the corporations and the rich. The rest are already paying through the nose. Here's what we'll do. We'll borrow the money. We'll be able to do the spending that's wanted without taxing the corporations and the rich because they've got us over a barrel. They've persuaded, donated to, bought the lobbyists for getting out of their fair share of taxes. And now the final step. Where does the government go to borrow all the money that it didn't tax from corporations and the rich? And the answer is, for most of it, they go right back to the corporations and the rich and borrow the money from them. And when you understand it, you realize that what corporations and the rich have done is to refuse to pay taxes and to get the government, instead of taxing them, to borrow the same amount of money from them, which means that corporations and the rich are not only not taxed, but they are given a debt. All of that money will be paid back to them in the future and a nice interest payment every six months while they wait. If you're a corporation and the rich, which would you rather do? Pay taxes and kiss the money goodbye or lend it to the government, same government, and have them give it back to you plus pay interest while they're holding it? Well, unless you are demented, the government, the corporations and the rich love this plan. And that's what they've been doing. But Fitch is letting them know you have abused this system so badly that it is now a level of debt it has accumulated, you know, tens of trillions of dollars, that it is becoming too difficult to pay all that back. It's becoming too difficult to pay interest on all of that accumulated debt. So we're here to tell you, you have abused it so far that it's no longer safe to continue to lend you corporations and the rich, because that's who Fitch talks to. Average people don't know who Fitch is. They think it's the brother of Mr. Abercrombie. It's not. And here's the reality. We're talking about Mr. the Fitch company telling corporations and the rich, and therefore the rest of us, the way that the rich have ripped off the mass of people with this public finance in which you don't pay taxes and substitute loans to the government has now gotten completely out of hand. We can't handle it. And there's no alternative flim flam available. And the Republicans are going to be the ones who drive that point home. They're going to figure out, it'll take them a while, but they'll figure out that they're now going to learn to use this Fitch decision to beat the Republicans, uh, the Democrats over the head by saying, we can't do this anymore. You can't keep borrowing the way you have. Therefore, the only way to deal with this situation is to cut the spending so you don't have to tax the corporations and the rich because they won't let you. And, and you won't have to borrow because you've cut the spending enough so that it isn't a problem. And you know what that means? Cutting Social Security benefits. It means cutting all kinds of supports. It means doing the kinds of things that Republican budgets have tried in the past to do, but haven't had the context allowing them to persuade the mass of people that they have to. And the way they'll do that is to say, if you don't do this, then the economy will collapse because the government will be unable to honor its debts. And that it'll be so devastating, you're going to let us 
cut spending. This scenario, which we are well down the road to, is what's in the back of Fitch's arguments that the governance of the United States is in a precarious place and there's no awareness, no public discussion, no admission that that's the case. And that makes lending to them very dangerous. And uh, the kicker to the kicker to all of this, it seems to me, Richard Wolf, is that when that discussion intensifies around, uh, because the Republicans will make it intensify, the media will be, as they long have been, uh, complicit and an accomplice in the crime of stealing people's financial security even more because the, what gets hand waved away right at the top of the media coverage is any idea of actually raising money on the rich yeah. or corporation they, they say well since that's not politically feasible and with that they've waved it away and then there'll be a whole article on what do we have to cut and it seems to me that's going to be intensified and you know fitch is not uh, uh a nice character in here they in the sense that uh they say notwithstanding the june bipartisan agreement to suspend the debt limit uh in other words that was you know that was okay when it wasn't okay because it involved spent even further spending cuts but that's uh, that's the limit and, and what they say which the republicans will avoid mentioning and the democrats are i believe aren't smart enough to bring up that and i'm quoting from fitch again the repeated debt limit political standoffs which is the republicans and last minute resolutions again forced by the republicans have eroded confidence in fiscal management in addition the government lacks a medium-term fiscal framework unlike unlike most peers and has a complex budgeting crisis these factors along with several economic shocks as well as tax cuts and new spending initiatives i think this, so in other words they're giving a pretty balanced picture overall but the whole part about the impact of the tax cuts and uh and uh, the showdowns the debt limit showdowns i believe our media coverage will drop that and in that way and i believe the democrats are either too complicit themselves or just too damn stupid to push them so let me let me tell you a quick story and then i want to turn it back uh in 2010 i was uh on a part of a small group of uh financial journalists or journalists journalists who do economically related reporting invited for a private off the record audience with tim geithner and uh which quickly became on the record but uh geithner and we, we, there was warm up the undersecretary i forget his name now uh was outraged because the new york times had just published uh a piece by tim geithner entitled welcome to your recovery summer that was the headline and they were furious they were saying that wasn't what secretary geithner was saying he wasn't declaring victory he was just saying things were getting better and you know some of the journalists tut tutted along with him and i said well you might want to think about what's wrong with your presentation that they came up with that title at all you know that they're telling you that your message is that things are fine which i think is how a lot of people hear it now it's happening again yep. bidenomics they've embraced the term things are fine uh so the public is struck faced with this cognitive dissonance i thought you may have even used that term uh and i guess my question for you is you know are we going to will the public break out of the uh sort of uh mental doom loop that's set up for them where the republicans talk about spending cuts the democrats don't reframe it the media goes along with it um is uh, you see any signs that that sort of mutual hypno hypnosis is is going to break down we can finally talk about things the way they are i think so uh i don't mean to be um flippantly optimistic but i am in fact optimistic and i think i would point to uh bernie sanders i would point to aoc i would point to the other young socialist 
and progressive in the real sense of the term uh, Democrats who have been telling their constituents and winning elections by making those constituents aware, which it's easy to do, that there has been, to use your language, RJ, something weirdly missing in these conversations. Why aren't we taxing corporations and the rich? Why has that been a taboo? It obviously solves the problem of government debt. If you tax them, you don't have to borrow. And it's the same money. We're talking about taxing them the money that you used to borrow from them. That was a scam we should not have allowed. And we're not now going to be told that we have to cut back on our social security checks or we have to have potholes lasting five years in our highways because you can't borrow anymore when you shouldn't have done that in the first place. I think you can go to the American people if the Democrats have the courage to do it and tell them although they'll have to admit the complicity you talk of because it is the truth that we've allowed something to go on for a very long time so that now Fitch has to tell these hustlers, because that's what corporations and the rich are, that the hustle they've been perpetrating cannot be continued. We now get to face the hustle and do something about it. I think partly because it's in the self-interest of the mass of American taxpayers, they're going to be quite interested in that story. They're going to understand that it will allow the government to do what it needs to do for the mass of people without loading up on more debt, which is no longer... How do you do that? You tax corporations and the rich. And when they scream and yell, "Gee, if we if you do that, it'll we won't invest," you know that kind of uh, blackmail. It's really what it is: economic blackmail. Then the mass of people are going to say, "Okay, then don't invest." You can't get us to continue to do what you have wanted us to do because we now see what the cost is. And I, I think Fitch is telling that the. Let's be blunt, the ruling class of the United States, you've got a problem here. You are walking into a, a whirring propeller. Maybe you'll come out at the end. Maybe you'll figure out a way to stick it to the mass of people and really avoid government debts in the future by cutting spending drastically. Maybe. But the word maybe hides the risk that you will provoke a level of anger and bitterness against this system that you really want to think about whether you want to run that at risk. And I think the smartest ones among them will understand what the significance is that a, a player, a member of the club like Fitch felt the need to raise the warning flag at this time. Let me tell you my concern and then maybe my uh, potential hope for optimism. And, you know, you can respond to that. My concern is sometimes I feel uh, as if behavioral modification is wasted on the Democrats. That, because everyone running the party now was around in 2010 when it was decided that Obama was going to run on his successes and they got their heads handed to them uh, so much uh, that uh, by 2012 he was singing a different tune, the kind of tune you're describing now, much more needs to be done, we know you're still hurting, that sort of thing. So in that sense it supports your, you know, your expressed optimism. The missing piece in between was that in 2011 we had the Occupy movement. Right. And the Occupy movement shook this country to the core in a good way. And it didn't come from the elites. It didn't come from Wall Street. It didn't come, it came from people. That movement, I think, went a long way towards changing the Democrats' tune. So I guess it seems to me that if they're going to change, here they are in 2022, 12 years later, 
singing the same song they were singing in 2010 when they lost Congress because of it. So it seems to me that on the one hand, their ability to like innately re-educate themselves leaves something to be desired, uh, but that maybe if the people organize again the way they did in 2011, we can get a different story out of them before you know before the next election what do you think well you know i long ago gave up predicting the the republican and democratic parties i'm optimistic that the american people will figure it out and that they will generate leaders who understand this and will explain it in ways that are politically powerful that much i there i'm an optimist whether the democratic party will be the place where that happens there I'm a pessimist. I don't think so. I think they have been compromised and softened uh, and rendered complicit with the premises of Republican economics, Republican Party economics. They're, you know, they are too quiet. They don't say a word really about corporations and the rich in terms of really doing something. The little bit of yelling they did about the absolutely unjustified Republican tax cuts under Trump in 2017, their promises, which were vague to undo all of that, they never did. The, the changes, the ratcheting up of the corporate profits tax was modest, didn't recover most of the cut that Trump had in there for them. I mean, it was really mealy mouthed. They were clearly afraid of offending corporations and the rich who would then fund the Republicans even more uh, lopsidedly than they already do, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't expect much. I think Bidenomics is exactly what you said. It is an advertising slogan meant to imply something cohesive, theoretically sophisticated. It's none of those things. Bidenomics is in economics what a Hail Mary pass is in a football game. It's when you can't do anything else, spend a ton of money, throw that money at the economy. Don't question that where that money goes is overwhelmingly into the hands of the largest corporations in America. Who do you think does infrastructure it's not money for the infrastructure to be honest it's money for the large corporations who do infrastructure and they are masters in making sure the minimum amount of that money trickles down to employees or anybody else most of it is siphoned off the top as it always has been which is why the business community likes the Biden program for infrastructure. They know where that will end up. They're not worried that it will leak down to the masses. And the masses know it won't leak down to them either. They know what trickle-down promises usually end up with. So I think you're dealing with a slow but steady disassociation of the mass of people's economic needs and dreams and anything that the Republicans or the Democrats will ever deliver. Mr. Trump did not deliver on his, his economic promises with the exception of the tax cut for corporations and the rich. And when the dust settles, that's exactly what will remain of the Democrats Bidenomic spending extravaganza. And you know what that shows us? That history hasn't changed. Republicans cut the taxes of the rich and Democrats spend on the corporations that make people rich. And that's their job because they are both enthusiastic boosters for the American brand of capitalism. The Fitch announcement of August 7th is a statement that that model of capitalism is running out of gas. 
That's why dollars are not what they once were. That's why the competition from China is so hard to to deal with. These are all the signs of a downturn in an empire. And there's so much more we could talk about, including your profession of economics and their role in all this. But they're too busy telling me this week that we had terrible news, which was that too many jobs were created. Uh, so already you're, we're in bizarro world. But with that, we'll have to leave it again. Richard Wolf, economist, economic historian, and so much more. As always, a pleasure talking with you, even though it's not necessarily a pleasurable topic. And as always, thanks for coming on the program. My pleasure, RJ. And let's keep it going because these alternative ways of making sense, that's itself a product of the decline of this system. We're part and parcel. What comes out of our mouth is shaped by the same environment that shapes Republicans, Democrats, and all the others. So I look forward to continuing it with you as well. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Eskow, and this is The Zero Hour.